2023 Lagos State governorship election debate coming to you live from here in the commercial capital of Africa's most populated and dynamic city and Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. This much anticipated debate is brought to you courtesy of the Platform Nigeria, a non-profit and non-partisan organization whose sole remit for more than 15 years has been to showcase the best ideas for a better, more equitable, sustainable, greater, and most certainly, a more prosperous Nigeria, a Nigeria of our dreams, a Nigeria we can all believe in, and a Nigeria we can all be proud of. My name is Victor Oladukun, and for the second time in four years, it really has been an honor to return as the moderator of this live debate broadcast on Channels TV and live streamed on the platforms of YouTube, Channels, and ChannelsTV.com. On behalf of the Platform Nigeria, I'd like to thank our gubernatorial contestants for showing up and for participating in this debate. Now, just a few minutes ago, before we went live, the candidates participated in a ballot draw to decide the order in which they would answer the opening and the closing questions. They will answer both of those questions in that order, which you'll get to hear about um, as we get to those portions of the program. But first, a few quick highlights of some of the ground rules that the candidates have committed to. Number one candidates will be limited to a maximum of 90 seconds each to respond to each question. With 30 seconds remaining, the timekeeper will provide an audible bell ring signifying the amount of time left to wrap up. No additional time will be allowed and unfortunately, I have the responsibility of being the hard taskmaster. Second, the contestants will not be allowed the use of mobile phones or devices during the debate. And number three, the debate will be divided into three segments. Each segment will deal with specific issues and provide contestants with one 60-second rebuttal each, if so needed, and a short commercial break. The third and the final segment will provide the candidates with an opportunity to provide closing comments concerning their leadership, their vision, and their plans. And finally, number four, the debate will last approximately two hours from when we started. And so, at this point, there really is a lot at stake and a lot in store. So, stay tuned. For now, join me in welcoming the convener of the platform, Waju Oyemade. To our live audience, can you give him a warm round of applause? Thank you, Dr. Victor Oladukum. Um, in opening the debate today, I just want to share a few thoughts for about three minutes as to why we as an organization um, have decided to hold debates among political candidates. Debates are important because they help develop critical thinking among the electorate. And the success of any democracy hinges on how educated and informed the electorates are. A Washington think tank, the National Democratic Institute, from their research findings, had this to say. Debates have been found to be helpful because they address issues, not persons, religion, or ethnicity. This elevation within the consciousness of people is required for right leaders to be chosen, and most especially in our nation at this point in time. Debates also have been found to promote more political tolerance, lessening physical and verbal abuse among people. It promotes constructive dialogue and service to the people. Senator Bob Dole, the presidential candidate of the Republican Party in the United States in 1996 said, debates force us to think ahead. President Bill Clinton, former US president said, I am convinced the debates I went through 
made me a better president. In a divided election environment, debates give political rivals a chance to show that despite their differences, they can treat each other with mutual respect while they disagree on issues. Finally, debates also provide a chance for a candidate to commit publicly to a peaceful election, including agreeing to accept election results and to use non-violent channels to resolve election disputes. This is why we chose to hold this debate to, to reduce the influence of the things that divide us and to elevate critical, the critical faculty in the electorate through which the best leaders emerge. I'd like to thank all the political parties that agreed um, to attend um, this debate. And I'll also like to urge every one of us to keep the environment neutral while, so that we can listen to the ideas and the thoughts of the candidates. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Kwajo Yemadi, the convener of this debate. Thank you very much for those opening comments. Um, this evening, we begin the 2023 Lagos State gubernatorial debates with our first question. A first question that deals head on with the big elephant in the room, which we obviously cannot ignore and that is insecurity in Lagos State. Just two days ago, armed thugs and supporters of a particular candidate were filmed in broad daylight firing weapons at supporters of another political party in Surulere. On account of this incident, which has already gone viral, Governor Sawulu's spokesperson announced yesterday that the governor would be pulling out of this debate essentially because he does not intend to share the stage or the platform with a particular candidate on this stage tonight whose supporters he alleges carried out the alarming attacks that have shocked all Nigerians. Now, while Governor Sawulu has decided not to participate in this much-anticipated political debate and exchange of ideas, we would still like to welcome to the platform, in the alphabetical order of their respective parties, the following candidates. And as they come on stage, ladies and gentlemen, kindly give them a warm and a resounding round of applause representing the Labour Party, Badiba Rhodes Vivor. And representing the African Democratic Congress, ADC, kindly welcome to the stage, Funsho Doate. <laughs> and last but certainly not the least, Abdul Aziz Olajide Jando Adidiran representing the People's Democratic Party, PDP. Now, gentlemen, good evening and welcome. Good evening. Under normal circumstances, I would have kicked off this debate with a question about what you believe best qualifies you to run for office as governor of Lagos State. But these are not normal times, and therefore I will not ask that question. 
as representatives of your respective parties, the assumption is that you are more than well fit for office. So instead of me starting with my first question in that regard, I'm going to ask the much more critical question at this point, which deals with the big elephant in the room, insecurity in Lagos State. With each of you as candidates running for the highest political office in Lagos State, on this platform, this evening, publicly, will you make the decision right now to disavow political violence and read the riot act to your supporters who may be inclined to intimidate voters through acts of violence. I'm going to start first with Funshua Doherty and then come to Gbadibo Roads Vivo and end with Abdulaziz Olajide Jando Adidiron in that order. But I want you to stick straight to, the, to that issue. Will you publicly disavow political violence? And what's your message to your supporters? Funshua Doherty first. Thank you very much, Victor, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I certainly would disavow pub, uh, any form of violence, political or otherwise, and I do so publicly now uh, before this audience and before the nation. Uh, I think this has no place in our political, um, in our political affairs. Uh, and I think just uh, a week and a half ago, we attended a meeting with the Commissioner of Police and actually all the heads of all the security agencies. So the video that went viral, uh, whilst it's not something that we haven't seen before, actually took me, um, took me aback. I will say that um, we understand that investigations are ongoing, so we should not preempt the outcome of those investigations. But that kind of activity has no place in our political sphere, and I disavow it publicly now. Thank you very much. Mr. Viva. So I disavow all forms of political thuggery, intimidation, voter suppression, because it's more than even just shooting of people or carrying out acts of violence. There's a lot of violence that has been happening throughout the collection of voter card process. And also, there's a culture of thuggery that has been celebrated in Lagos State for a very long time. It's extremely hypocritical that the agro menace that has expanded in Lagos for so long. That's even so during the NSARS protest, BRT buses with people coming out with matches in front of the state house, with the governor sitting down in his office. And the hypocrisy of it is very, very disappointing that he will not be here for that reason. At the same time, it's important that we move forward in Lagos State in a civilized manner and restore Lagos State to the center of excellence in its politics and in its thinking that it always was. So I disavow all forms of political um, violence in Lagos State and in my campaign and with the Labour Party. Thank you very much. And to the man who seems to be in the center of this all, Mr. Abdulaziz Alajide Jando Adidiron, what is your take on this? Well, um, first, unfortunately, the Chief Security Officer of the state is not here. I think you have been in the best position to tell us who the culprits were, really. Um, as you can see, we've been at the center of this, I mean, uh, of the attack since the beginning of electionary campaign in the state of Lagos. And um, we've done one thing to ensure that we carry along the security apparatus of the state to let them know what we face each time we go out. And um, it's been a pattern, especially against us. Um, event of two days ago was very, very unfortunate. I was there to campaign uh, in Suleri, and um, I don't think I would have gone there to shoot the people I went to campaign to. Uh, but in their usual manner, they have to really obtain this and try to play a victim card. But the people of Lagos do know, and they are ready to do the needful. So for me and my supporters, we are going to ensure that we will continue with our electionary campaign as peaceful as possible, and we won't do any form of violence. And you're, you're, I just need to be clear here, you're going to put out a strong message to your supporters in this regard. I'm saying it again and again. It is never our parting, and we will ensure that nobody in our campaign team is found wanting. 
Gentlemen, thank you very much for your response, and this is really critical. We, we must have an election, and we must have free and fair elections in the midst of peace and with the electorate being safe. So thank you very much for these assurances, and the electorate of Lagos State will be holding you accountable in this regard. So I'm going to ask the next question, which is also linked to security, and I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Dediron first. I'd like you to, 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 to take up first, and that's with regards to the need to curb insecurity in Lagos in general, including the, a clampdown, a very clear clampdown, on gangsters who continually terrorize law-abiding citizens. What's your concrete plan for meaningfully rehabilitating area boys who are often convenient tools in the hands of politicians, as well as prosecute rogue policemen who kill, maim, and brutalize innocent Lagosians? The first question to you. Okay, quick one. You've used the word tools in the hands of, you know, the, the governing party as we speak. No, I didn't uh, say the government. I didn't say the governing party. But that's the fact. No, I didn't say the government. I didn't say the government okay. party. So I I'm, say, I'm saying that as a matter of fact. Uh, fortunately, that is what we have. But again, in our own case, I've said it over and over again. I can also convert them to be tools, but uh, positive one for that matter. Especially the ones that we handed our motor packs to in the name of garages, and you observe that. Every day, wherever there is traffic on that corridor, you see people going to rob uh, people within that corridor. So I will say to whoever is in charge of any garage that the day I see anybody robbing anybody in this corridor, that's the day I'm going to take the garage away from you. You will see that they will secure that garage because they are making money in that garage. They don't want to lose that. So that's one tool you can convert them to. Again, we need to do what we call community uh, intelligentia, community policing. If we don't do that, because we rely on information to decide what is happening where, and you take a decision as a state security officer of the state, buy people's trust. Let them know that if you give you information, you will get it. A governor was uh, in this state before he opened his line to say, you can reach out to me. The moment they know they can reach out to you and you are going to work on it, you see the citizen will have that confidence to reach out to you and you do the needful. So we'll go, from uh, from, we'll go to preventive as against running after uh, then when, when it's happening. So with right information at the right time, we can move in. I started doing procurement and just buying guns every, every time to say this is what we want to do. It's about time we buy the trust of the citizens of Lagos and say, let us do this together. And I'm sure we'll cop security from that. Information is key. Again, thank you very much. And to our remaining candidates, I, I still want us to focus a little bit here on what we need to do to rehabilitate young men and women. We're going to talk about the youth later on, but what can we do to rehabilitate young men and women who are tools in the hands of politicians? And what must we do to bring the full weight of the law to prosecute policemen who, again, take the law into their hands, as was done recently in a very, very well publicized case? I'm going to go next to Mr. Vivo for your response. Okay. Um, youth unemployment is a menace in legal states. And an ideal mind is a devil's workshop. So you have a situation where I've engaged youth every time I come out and they are like, yeah, like I'm doing all that voice. And as soon as I ask them, if I, give you, if, I give, if I create jobs, if I create a job for you, would you engage with it? Because there generally is an idea that these people are lazy and they don't want to do anything. And all of that voice making changes. At VI a week ago, I came out of Plus TV and the gentleman there, Five of them, one of them said he's a graduate of UNLAD from the art science department. Another one was, was from Usuka. Same thing at Apple Junction in Amu. They want jobs. So we're going to ensure that we give them employability skills and domicile it at the local governments. We're going to empower local governments, make them robust, so they are also security gathering agencies for Lagos State. We're going to give them vocational tools, formal tools, and also digital tools to be able to engage and also lastly at the local government level we're going to ensure that every graduate of this program that we do is companies that do all the inner roads and work with the local government are incentivized to hire these people so these these are some ways we'll tackle youth unemployment in terms of the cops and the police and harassment we have a special force with the dpp director of public prosecution to ensure that there's a hotline that people can call when they are harassed and will be 
actively going aggressively against this thing to make sure that we are not a lawless state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Doherty, you have the final word here. Thank you very much. And there are about three different issues that you raised there, and I'll, I'll touch on them one, one after the other. First has to do with the security agencies, and they are, they are going rogue and acting in ways in which they shouldn't. There are two main things that need to be done there. One is that we need to ensure that the welfare of these people is taken care of, because if we unleash security agencies in our, in our community and we do not take care of their welfare, it's only a matter of time before you begin to see them be turning into predators on the citizens themselves. Secondly, when we have errant people having taken care of their welfare, we pursue them with the full weight of the law and prosecute diligently. And the same way we would do for civil servants, for public service officers, we will, we will basically have a zero tolerance policy, prosecute and publicly show that we have dealt with these folks. Now, uh, with respect to youth and the unemployed, underemployed youth, one aspect of this is a long-term solution, which is that you have to build a society that is prosperous, that is broad-based, and that creates jobs across the system. What we've had is a situation where our economy has become increasingly concentrated, the wealth of the society in a few hands, and poverty has become a widespread issue. And to the extent that a large proportion of the population is poor, you're going to have societal problems like poverty, like crime. Finally, what I will touch on here is to say that there is an element of state sponsoring in what is going on here. To the extent that the Agbero community is a part of the political structure of Lagos State, there is no political will to deal with that problem. And if there is no political will to deal with it, there is no problem, there is no problem that is harder to solve than a problem that you do not want to solve. And we are saying the first thing to do is to change the government and bring in political will. Mr. Dirty, thank you very much. I just want to thank you, gentlemen, for being very, very good with being on time. Very much appreciated. Difficult at times, but you guys are just spot on, so thank you very much. Now, in spite of much progress that has taken place in several years, over the years, in Lagos State, yes, there are challenges, yes, there are problems, but there also have been progress. But in the 2022 Intelligence Unit Report of the Economists, it ranked Lagos State, Nigeria's commercial capital, and home to 23 million people as the second worst city to live in in the world. It actually ranked Lagos State 171 out of 172 cities. Now, let's be clear. The issue of social development in Lagos, and economic development, is a decades-old issue another problem of one administration. So I encourage you to keep that in perspective. So today, I want to deal with the first question here, which concerns transportation and infrastructure. Today, millions of Lagosians have to wake up as early as 4 a.m. in the morning. Many of them don't get home till 9 p.m. at night. 10, well, the audience says 10 p.m. I have to believe the audience. So my question is, what plans do you have to reduce the impact of inadequate transportation infrastructure on the mental and physical well-being of Lagosians and to enhance productivity? But I'm going to shoot the first question to Mr. Vivor here, and I want you to concentrate on road safety concerns and the enforcement of traffic regulations in the 90 seconds that you do have. Yeah, so the basic foundation that is going to move Lagos forward in terms of livability is having a proper train network system. We're going to deliver about 160 kilometers in four years of rail. Lagos State has tried to do that, but with 14 years, they've only been able to do 16 kilometers of rail. In laying that foundation, we can then allow for much more even distribution of projects, development all across Lagos State. As an architect, when you look at Lagos State, this planning of it is all centralized. We need to decentralize developments in Lagos State to ensure that people don't have to come all the way into Lagos Central and connect it efficiently. 
most of, one of my plans is to have a circular road that links the entire Lagos East, a coastal line from VI all the way down to Bejuleki and Ikorodu all the way to Ekpe, and connect it with short bridges that are not further than six kilometers apart. It's much more efficient than the Fort Milan bridge that they're trying to do and be much cheaper. In achieving this and reducing the pressure of cars on our roads, the pressure on enforcement, law enforcement, road safety, and all of that will be significantly reduced. Also, when we put into place the, um, a fight against lawlessness, we take away the agro system where all of these people carry on without feeling any need to behave responsibly, then Lagos State will actually move, will start moving efficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Mr. Doherty, I'd like you to concentrate a little bit here on multimodal forms of transportation. What else other than rail do we need to, to engage in and develop in order to ease the burden that this is on the 23 million people who call Lagos State home? Thank you. And, and that's a great question. And I like the fact that you emphasize the multimodal. See, one of the things about Lagos that we have is a geographic natural advantage. The fact that we're on the coast, and not just that we're on the coast, but we also have the lagoon, which runs pretty much through the entire state. One of the things that we have not made full use of is the ability of bringing our waterways into the multimodal transportation system. We think that this is one area where you can get some quick wins, just identify a few key routes, and it, it, it's an area where you can bring um, um, robust vessels in, and within a short space of time, you can move a substantial number of people. If you took the route from Ikorodu to the island, for example, whether it's to VI or to the Aja Axis, you'd be amazed how many people would make that commute on a daily basis. If government put in a robust alternative in there, you would see a whole, a whole lot of change. If you combine that with rail, where I agree also with Badebo on this issue of rail and the fact that it's taken us 14 years to deliver something, which, by the way, has been commissioned, but it's not operational yet, so we have not delivered it. Um, you know, there's a whole range of things that we need to do there. But before I run out of time, I just want to say that the multimodal concept, which we must pursue and deliver in a short period of time, is just one aspect of the problem. We, the road infrastructure is also another problem, and the use of the road infrastructure. I liken it to an airport. If you think about a busy airport like Heathrow, imagine the number of people that go through Heathrow on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, imagine if you didn't have lines, if you didn't have order, if you had disorder, you had chaos. Probably only a fraction of the people who went through Heathrow would be able to go through that airport. It's a similar thing with our road infrastructure. We are not getting the best benefit of even the road infrastructure that we have because we have chaos and disorder on the road. And we have agents of disorder. We have the agueros. We have law enforcement agents that are not well paid and are part of the problem. And so even the road infrastructure that we have, we don't get the benefit of. And we can continue building roads. And we want to spend $2.5 billion now on Fort Mainland Bridge, which, by the way, when we come in, we will stop that and we'll review the project before going ahead with it. But we need to do more with getting order on our roads. Thank you very much. And to Mr. Didiro, just a few hours ago, actually as I was preparing to come um, on the platform, there was a news flash about um, a container truck that lost control and killed, I believe, nine pedestrians in the process. <laughs> Uh, the issue of rogue, again, container trucks, uh, congestions with regards to trailers is a major problem in Lagos State. What's your idea about how we can decongest this? We've been talking about decongesting the roads, whether it's um, a papa, whether it's other access, for well over 40 years in Lagos State, but yet nothing has happened. What do you intend to do? Okay, quickly, I will speak about um, what we, we can do in the interim before going to what we call a lasting solution. But the first thing is, can we identify flashpoints? Now I'm speaking to where you have bottlenecks in Lagos State. We know where they are. Uh, Oshodi, Yanopaja, all of these axes. But I'll pick one. In some of this area, it doesn't require infrastructural renewal to start with. It requires government will. Um, let me give you an example. If you're traveling between going to a better, you see an order coming up, and that order is coming from the intersection of um, Akumojo, you know, and all that. If you move forward a bit, and that intersection, you don't need anything there. You have NURTW people, you have police, you have LASMA, you have market women. All you need to do 
clear that place, you flow. So until you get to Reloquay Junction, people busting out, you know, Reloquay will give you another one. So what we need to do in all those acts is when you move down to La Suiba Road, you see um, Loma truck on the road, also causing this um, uh, bottleneck. If you move down to uh, Igodo bus stop, you see the same thing you saw in that one. So in those places, we don't require, and we have many of them, about 12 of them, flashpoint like that, we don't require infrastructure renewal policy to clear down. Then let's come to final solution because we can't do that in one year. Lekki Ajay Expressway, solution to that one is that every intersection you have on that place, fly them over. We have what it takes to fly them over. If you fly them over, you see the travel time between VI and Nepal will be smooth. Another one we need to do is to build alternative routes from Elenogbe down to Itomu to Badori. That one will take you off. If you don't have business in Shogute, do a way, yeah, and all of that. It takes you off that axis and bust out to the Tiosa. Now, let's speak to this container issue. Yes, of course, solution is to have badge taking containers to wherever they are going. If you build a dry port, they can take it from. But we don't have that now. Let's go back to restricting them, restricting their travel time. You don't come during the day. Come at between 7 p.m. or thereabout. And if you have that in Lagos, then we know we have we have resolved that problem. Now, if we must take a look about how to free up our Lagos, if you're going towards Terminal Bridge in the morning, watch on your left, you see Oworoshoki, expanse of land. We will build a park and ride there for you to jump on ferry that will take you to the island, and you don't need to bother yourself. That one will reduce the number of vehicles on the Third Milan Bridge. That's the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, gentlemen, for all of this. Greatly appreciated. Um, Mr. Vivo, I'd like to talk to you about road safety concerns and the enforcement of traffic regulations. Yeah. Your thoughts? Um, we need to train our road enforcement agents, and we also need to ensure that the state sets this clear policy on not accepting the agro system, which has really been a system that has created a lot of bottlenecks and lots of safety hazards in Lagos State. Um, all of this, you can only enforce where a system is moving smoothly. So I always still focus back on making sure that we have a system that's moving smoothly. We can also, we're going, also going to have digital surveillance all across the state so that we can enforce with evidence. It's not just hearsay anymore. So the, um, enforcement officers that do not step up to their responsibilities can actually be held accountable and we can hold them to, you can hold them to account with evidence so that's one of the things we're going to do another thing that I want to touch on is the fact that transportation system that we're doing in terms of rail must take into account moving cargo the fact that we're moving so many containers on the road is damaging our roads and is creating very low life expectancy for the roads we have and also leading to accidents like what happened today. So we must ensure that our real development, like the one that's currently on from um, the ports to Ebutemeta, must be focused on, we must focus on using rail to move people and cargo. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, again, we want to deal with some of the hot button issues that affect us here in Lagos State. And my next question, uh, concerns education. Now, three countries globally, India, Nigeria, and Pakistan, have the highest numbers of out-of-school children. In Nigeria, the numbers are an estimated 15 million, 1.5 million, of which 2 million of them, according to statistics, are in Lagos State. So my first question goes to Mr. Doherty in this, yeah. this regard. Uh, last year, Lagos introduced history as a subject after several decades of not being on the curriculum. As a historian myself, I would say that's a step in the right direction because if we cannot learn from history, we'll always make the mistakes of history. In a world of dynamic change, what other elements do you think we need to add to our educational curriculum to help create the workforce of today and of the future? Thank you, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we obviously need to do is to review our curriculum. And this is something that we will do within the first 100 days uh, of coming into office. We need to be sure that our system is producing um, 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 graduates from our system that are fit for purpose, fit for our economy, but also enable us to compete in a global context, which is the, the world in which we live. Um, we also think that our educational system, in Lagos particularly, needs to be broadened and the range of vocational and technical options needs to be further broadened. 
Um, if you think about an economy like Lagos, it's been a commercial capital for centuries. Um, we, will we will continue to be a center of commerce, a center of manufacturing, a center of industry. One of the advantages that we have here in Lagos is that we are a port city and we have a large population which is sitting right on the coast and that's a large market uh, and it's also uh, a potentially large workforce. So if you think about Lagos, Lagos is almost a natural draw for any manufacturer who wants to establish a business for export and for local consumption. And what we need to do is to ensure that our educational system is producing graduates that can give them the skilled workers that they need for those businesses. And that's going to be a core element of our overall strategy. So expanding the range of vocational options. If you look at the, the number of children in schools in Lagos today, you have probably just north of a 1 million in public schools. Only about 1% of that number are in technical schools. So we need to, that, that's about 10,000. We need to expand that uh, tremendously. Um, we also need to increase the linkages between the educational system and the business community. Because when we do this, we then create entrepreneurs who can come out and establish businesses that employ one, two, and three, and four people. And this is what economies like Lagos are built on. And so essentially moving the educational system in a direction that uh, engages our youth, produces a skilled workforce, and enables us to become an attractive destination for businesses, I think is a core of our own uh, strategy. Thank you very much, Mr. Duarte. And the next question, question is to Mr. Rhodes Vivor here. Um, Mr. Duarte talked about an increase in the number of vocational schools. And it used to be many, many years ago in Lagos State, yes. there were vocational schools everywhere, pretty much. Um, to grow a world-class city, you need vocations that can support that. Exactly. Aside from vocational schools, how do you intend to improve the quality and the quantity of primary and secondary schools, particularly because it does seem that a number of the schools right now, private schools especially, are unregulated? Yes. What's um, the connection you, you intend okay. to make here? So uh, about 14% for primary schools and just over 25% for secondary schools, uh, the, the, that's the pop, of the population of people that are going to school are going to public schools. So Lagos State has already passed an indictment on the public school system. There's also an issue with unequitable distribution of schools. You have children walking from, as, you know, from Ojo to Ijegun to get to school. You have children going from Aja trying to get to Lagos Island to get to school. So creating these bottlenecks is a major problem for children to get into school and actually stay in school. Another issue that we need to understand is the social aspect of all of this. We have two million children out of school. Some of these schools are apparently free, right? So there's another element in this that's making it this way. One of them, for instance, is what is the welfare and mental state of their primary caregivers, their mothers, who are supposed to wake up in the morning and get them ready to go to school? Who is collecting data on that? And this is why we need a strong, robust local government system that will gather all this data and step in when help is needed by the primary caregiver. That is one. The second issue that we have is you have an education system where the quality of education that you are getting in there does not give you any skills that you can actually use in life. There's a lot of cramming. So for us, what we're going to do as a government is improve employability skills. Vocational skills is one, but also ensure we have after-school programs to give children practical application of knowledge they, that they have. We also, uh, we also look at this curriculum again. There are some children in Lagos State that are still learning that Mongo Park discovered the River Niger when their ancestors had been bathing there when the Europeans were living in caves. So we need to look at our education system and ensure that they have skills that can actually allow them to earn a decent living and make them productive members of society. Another thing that we are going to look at with education is to ensure that in every application, especially with digital, you know about CHAP GT now, AI, we need to start infusing digital technology into our education so we don't get too far left behind. It's extremely important that at every primary school they have access to computers and digital technology. Thank you very much, Mr. Rotivo. And we will come to the, um, to, to the space of digital technology and the whole ecosystem 
uh, in the third segment of our program, but very good point there. I'm going to come to Mr. Olajide Jando Adidiron. You've heard the numbers, two million. What is it that we can do to ensure that this army of uneducated, many times not on account of any fault of theirs, do not grow up into a generation that's unemployed and unem uh, unemployable? Practical solutions. Your thoughts? Okay, so something is upon us which is uh, unfortunate, um, despite the huge revenue that has accrued to the state of Lagos, which is the over 2 million out of school children. So when we come into office, first thing to do is to see how much of these children of ours I can take off the streets. How? I'll go into partnership with the registered 5,000 private schools that we have in Lagos State. First, I have to call a meeting and seek for the assistance and say, you know what, I have some of our children out of school. I want to see how many of them I can spread across your school. I'll give them uniform, give them learning aids, give them anything in exchange for incentives or tax holiday, as the case may be. That would achieve something for us. <laughs> Secondly, I have to also go into partnership with churches and mosques, you know, and I say, you know what, you have your space that you're not using between the school hours. I have some of my children. Can I take them here? I'll get them somebody who will take care of them, teach them what they need to do. Between that time, pending when I'll then embark on aggressive infrastructural renewal of classrooms across the board and all of that. So if we do this, it will first reduce the number of out of school we, uh, children we have in Lagos without spending fortune to that one. That's number one. I have visited 193 wars in 245 wars of Lagos. Everywhere I go to is a story of we have no PhD, is a story of we have no primary school, is a story of we have no secondary school, is a story of we have no teachers. And in, in, in Lagos State, we have this law that President Mohamed, Mohamed Buhari approved and signed into law 65 years of age for uh, retirement age for teachers and 40 years in service. Lagos State government is the only government or hasn't implemented that. When I come, I will not only implement that. I will bring back those that have retired within that space to come back so that we can have more people within the system. And so where we don't have teachers, we then have people to send there and people to also mentor the new one that we are going to take. So in terms of curriculum, we, we're discussing that it's about time we speak to even YEC and say, you know what, we have situation in our country today. Everybody, all of our sisters, after university education, they go to learn tailoring. And all. Can we have this in school so that they don't waste another time in learning this thing so that we can take it up with this? Well, gentlemen, this brings us to the end of part one of the debate, and I want to thank you for your civility and civil engagement and your responses. We're going to take a short commercial break, and when we come back, we'll hear more from the men and the candidates who intend to become the next governor of Lagos State. Stay with us. Lagos State Gubernatorial Debate 2023, live from Lagos, happening now. Back to the 2023 Lagos State gubernatorial debate brought to you by the platform Nigeria. Before we went to a break, we were engaged in discussions, substantive discussions, with our three candidates who are present with us today, absent the, the representative of the APC. Just in case you're joining us, uh, there is a context and there is a background to that, and I'm sure you've probably followed that on social media. But I want to move our conversation along here and deal again with another niggling problem uh, that Lagosians have had to deal with pretty much for decades. And I'm going to throw this question out to you, and I'm going to have Mr. Funcho um, Doherty answer. Actually, I'm going to have Mr. Um, Funcho Doherty answer first, Mr. Jando Adidiron, and then Mr. Rodzivo third in that order. But I'm just going to bunch the question together, and that deals with waste management, sanitation, and water. Now, the statistics show that only 10% of the 23 million people who live in Lagos have access to pipe bomb water. Plastic pollution and all forms of pollution is a perennial problem. Waste management and recycling is still not where it should be. What do you gentlemen 
intends to do. In the order that I asked earlier, please provide us with a response. Thank you. Um, and these are two critical areas. And when you think about a city like Lagos with you know, between 20 and 30 million people, depending on you know, who you ask and which census, think about the amount of water that is needed. If you think about the amount of waste that is generated on a daily basis in a city like Lagos, it's incredible. It's not a trivial challenge. One of the things that we have said is that the, a, a big part of the problem that we face today is that waste management is an area that is looked at as a place to award patronage contracts. All right? And so essentially what you have is a situation where it's, it's a place where money for the boys is not really about merit, it's not really about who can do the job right, and it's not about um, uh, policing and ensuring that the folks who are contracted to do this work are doing it in the way in which they should. There's also not sufficient thought about how to create an integrated waste management system. So it's one thing to pick up the waste, but then what are we doing with the waste subsequently? The recycling, the composting, the, the ultimate, where they ultimately end up. Um, we think also things like waste to power is something that should be explored in a city like Lagos. If you think about Lagos, we have a waste problem on the one hand, we have a power problem on the other. This, this is an area where we could have a symbiotic, um, symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, with respect to water, it's actually a tragedy that we do not have pipe-borne water basically in Lagos, right? Um, most places do not have pipe-borne water. And we do not have an overall plan that will ensure that the city as a whole has pipe-borne water. One of the things that we will do is we will have a, um, a, a road map to pipe-borne water across the city. And that's not a problem that will be resolved in a short period of time. So we start off uh, perhaps with neighborhoods, with places that will be served, perhaps with boreholes and so on. But ultimately, we want to get to a situation for a mega city like Lagos where there is pipe-borne water across the state. Thank you very much. Okay, so first I'll take um, the waste management um, and landfills. Unfortunately, we've been on this over and over again, and we've not found a solution. I listened to the man that ran away uh, when he had an interview saying that he had a solution to landfills, but a particular company wants him to do a PPA before they can take up you know, um, that in Lagos to, for waste um, to wealth or to energy. Uh, I see no reason why we shouldn't do that. If you are giving me a solution to my problem, I'll give you a PPA um, so that you can come bring the solution. If I don't give you a PPA, of course, I'll still purchase the power anyway from anywhere. So, and again, this will give employment to my people. So I will take on that solution so that I will first address this issue of um, landfills. Then on, on waste management, I think... Um, we can't have a government to do that. We have to engage the PSP and PSP in truth, not just PSP of uh, political leaders and accolades, you know, um, taking this thing out. On pipe bond water, it's unfortunate. A governor in this state, when he was leaving office, between four years, 2007 and 2011, gave us 15 minimum water works in Nojokoro, in the Keja, in Magodo, in Alausa, and the Pori minimum water, water works. And each of them are doing 1 to 1.3 million gallons a day. Uh, and this gov governor also resuscitated the Jew at Dion and even the Domola in Epe, you know, um, uh, major water works. But today, everything is in Komato. The way we resuscitate that, the first thing we need to do is to go back there and see the state of this uh, infrastructure of ours and bring it back. You know, this water of a thing has been a, a conduit, you know, for corruption in the state of Lagos over the years. But when we get to the office, we need to quickly bring this back because if we're speaking about our health, then we need to speak about having clean water. So we're taking this and we're declaring a state of emergency as far as this is concerned because it's a big problem in our hands. And um, we'll be born. I, I'm going to have to stop you there and go to Mr. Rhodes before here, but I'm going to tag team on where you just ended up, a state of emergency. Mr. Yeah. Rose Vivo, so, the paradox of water. Yes, yeah, so I'll start with water. An abundance of water in flooding. So I say that again, please. There's a paradox of water in Lagos. Yes, Mr. We have an abundance water. with floods. Yes. And we have very little to drink. Mm -hmm. Your solution. Okay, so those are three topics that are all linked, and I'm going to take all three. Um, if you imagine how much Nigerians, Lagosians, will save if they could drink water from their taps how much pollution will be reduced if they didn't have to buy pure water sachets and 
water bottles, then you actually know the real effect of this lack of water supply. As far back as 1910, Darucha was pumping water from Jew Works to Lagos Island. So we need to look into this again. We need to unbundle the water corporation system. We need to focus firstly on places with the worst quality of water so that because there are so many, especially the riverine communities, that don't have the capacity to treat their water, that's where we're going to start with focus on to ensure that they have clean water. And now we're going to tie this into flooding. Lagos State, unfortunately, does not have a wetland protection policy. People just sand fill anyhow, you know, driven by great developers just sand fill and block the natural movement of water out of the city. In my government, we'll have a water, it will have a wetland protection plan that is sacrosanct to development because wetlands are nature's natural reservoirs for water. Developments must never inhibit the flow of water out of the city. You see what's currently happening now across um, Third Mainland where they're starting some film Makoko. Lagos Mainland is going to start flooding next rainy season and they'll say, hey, climate change. But no, these are, these are negative decisions that are made by governments. And lastly, with waste management, we're going to separate waste directly from the home, organic waste, plastic waste, and paper, and to be incentivized at the local government level so that the resources from it go directly to the local government. And we generate biogas bio, um, and uh, fertilizer from organic waste. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Again, moving along to our very next question, which concerns, again, in many ways, uh, the 23 million people of Lagos State. And this is health. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, there are only 2,561 registered doctors in Lagos State. The World Health Organization minimum is one doctor to 1,000 patients. The ratio in Lagos, however, is one doctor to 8,980 patients. That is almost nine times more than what the World Health Organization recommends. Gentlemen, we have a challenge. It's not insurmountable. And again, this is a challenge that actually overlaps administrations. But I want you to bring new thinking, new ideas, new innovative solutions to the table. And I'm going to start first with Mr. Rhodes Vivo, second with Mr. Fonsha Doherty, and I'm going to come back to Mr. Alajide Jando Adidira in that order. What are the innovative solutions that you intend to bring to the table if elected governor of Lagos State? So we're going to focus on primary health care at the local government level. Like I said, the bedrock of good governance is ensuring that you have a robust local government. And we're going to focus a lot of resources on ensuring that we have quality primary health care that can run between 15 to 24 hours in a day. We're also going to expand the number of primary health care centers that we have in Lagos State. And we're going to partner with NGOs and ensure that there's no barrier to entry for them to be able to get involved. We must normalize diagnostic tests. Lots of people just self-treat and then create secondary problems that then lead to um, further health complications down the road. We're going to normalize diagnostic tests and normalize micro health insurance. Well, as a government, we're going to focus on the, on the demand side of healthcare. As opposed to focusing on spending so much money on doctors, we're going to focus, put a lot of money in healthcare and partner with the private sector as well to ensure that a lot of funds are injected into the healthcare system. So we're focusing on preventative medicine, primary health care, and we are going to educate the citizenry on the route by which they can get health care. So first from a health post where they can call and get um, advice, then the primary health care center before they go to the general hospital or the tertiary institution so that people don't just go to, the, to loot to take care of headaches. You must be going to there with a diagnostic report that actually says you need to go there. I want to normalize that so there's a clear route that takes people at each point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Dirty. Thank you. Um, health for us is a central area. One of our, we have a tiger agenda, and, and the E is education and health systems that people trust. And that word trust is very important because even the system, the health facilities that we have now, the primary health care facilities, people have opted away from those services. 
right? Very often they will go to pharmacists, they will go to traditional medical practitioners, they will go anywhere but to go to a government facility unless they have no option. Uh, and this is because the healthcare system is not delivering care. Our focus in health is we have a barbell approach. On one end of the barbell, we agree with uh, Badibo's position, is a focus on primary health care. We think this is critical. We think this is where we are seeing the greatest um, loss as a community, whether in terms of mortality, uh, in terms of uh, a loss of our resources, human resources. So for us, um, newborn care, maternal care, uh, early childhood care, in, prime, in, a, in, a, in a primary health care context, are for us are critical. We think also that it's important that, um, you know, this notion of we're losing doctors. You see, you can't separate it from the issue of compensation. You cannot. At the end of the day, if you do not compensate workers well, whether they are government workers, whether they are uh, doctors, or whether they are civil servants, you get what you pay for. So in a sense, part of our government reform agenda, which translates also in our healthcare space, is that people need to be better compensated. And not just doctors, but nurses and all our patient care technicians within our health facilities. We also need to monitor quality and ensure that we have processes in there, just as you would if you were running any business, for ensuring that people are delivering the care. And then we need to monitor using customer surveys, etc., to understand what are the experiences that, that people are, are having from our, from our facilities. Thank you very much. And on that note, we'll go to Mr. Jando Adidio. Okay, so first, uh, um, on shortage of doctors, I think uh, brain drain is not only on the issue of uh, health, it's, it's everywhere. And the only way to, uh, to address that is to make sure uh, you have a competitive um, wage and um, conducive, conducive uh, working environments across the globe. But there is a problem that we have, even beyond the primary health center. I'm coming to the primary health center, but even at the level of tertiary and secondary, you see when you get to any general hospital in Lagos today, what you are faced with is no bed, no bed space for you to, to go into. But I think my government, what we are going to do first is to ensure that we automate all uh, health institutions in Lagos, both private and, and public. Automation in the sense that you do not send any patient to general hospital until, of course, you know there is a best place for you to put that person. If there is no space, keep my patient in your hospital, be managing it until we have a space. And in the interim, what we can also do is to ensure that we have a makeshift um, ward, just like we have during COVID, in the premises of this general hospital so that we can take on our people when they come there. I've been to 193 wards in, uh, out of the 245 wards in Lagos State, and I can tell you we have 106 of these wards with no PHC. Now, government of Lagos, I mean, of the man that ran away, will tell you that they have 370-something and I can tell you, those, that number is only on paper. I have been to all the places. There is nothing there. And I can, I, can, I can assure you that. But if he hasn't been there, he wouldn't know. Okay? And again, so what we then do is that to build a PHC in all of these wards, in villages, with resident nurses and doctors in that place. Because most of these places are in the river line. You have issues that we can't go there. We can't have a way there. But we put a resident there so that they can attend to our people. That's, that's what we're going to do. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Again, I, I would like to, to fast track us a little bit here and deal with another um, issue, again, that has been perennial pretty much for decades, and that is the issue of inadequate housing in Lagos State. But I'm going to approach it in three different ways, if you, if you gentlemen don't mind. But before I do that, let's provide a little bit of perspective. Lagos State has an estimated total of 1.49 million residential homes. With a population of 23 million, a city this size requires 2.69 million residential units, which means we have a deficit of 3.2 million homes. Now, considering that Lagos will be the third largest city in the world by 2030, what concrete plans do you have to address this huge challenge in an eco-friendly way? So I'd like to start, first of all, with Mr. Jandor Adinua. And what I want you to deal with is the issue of low-cost housing. OK, thank you very much. I think that no, nobody will give you that in four years. I think we should be guided so that uh, we won't give like somebody who said he's going to do something last year and now he hasn't done it. 
uh, it will be so difficult for you to bridge that gap in four years. But the first thing we are going to do is to look at the situation that we have found ourselves. In this state of Lagos, we have what we have, we have what they call Lagos homes, built by a governor, you understand? And those homes are still there, not occupied. And I'm aware that only 30% of Lagos workforce are catered for in the housing um, allowance of a thing. So I'm going to make sure that that houses are occupied by my own workers first and take the money from their salary in their housing so that we can allocate it because they're lying fallows. What they do with it now is to dash one um, theater heart practitioner who is this and all that. We need people who will use it and do that. So to stop taking this thing from them. Secondly, um, we will embark on low housing um, scheme is in our blueprint because the cost of land is the only thing that is different. The amount of money you use in building, aside from piling in Ekui, is the same amount you buy blocks and cement in uh, Ebeda and Akumojo. So what we're going to do, we're going into partnership with the private sector. I have the land. I give you the land. We're going to JV. Give me building of this nature here. And I can invite people in the informal sector to also plug into that. Because if we talk about this deficit, it's everybody, not just people in the former sector, and also use that to migrate those in the former sector into former so that I can bring them into my tax nets. That's, that's it. Thank you very much. And with that background and that context, Mr. Doherty, the enforcement of rental laws. Uh, for ages in this city, uh, the laws have been on the books about not charging potential renters two years or one year um, advanced rent, but yet the practice is prevalent. Your take. Obviously, quite a number of people in Lagos State cannot afford good and proper accommodation. This is a critical issue. How do you intend to deal with it? Um, well, I'll, I'll come to that, because, but I just want to touch briefly on the question, because this is a demand and supply problem. Right? And I think part of the issue that we have is that the scale on which we are thinking about the problem is too small. The scale on which government is thinking about the problem is too small. They're thinking in terms of 100 homes and 200 homes and 300 homes. No. We need to be thinking about thousands of homes. And even the kinds of people that we partner with, uh, those kinds of institutions that have delivered those kinds of developments in similar cities across the world. And government can be an effective partner to them and do the things which government does, which is to create the structural environments, provide guarantees where they are required, provide institutional arrangements, and the private sector will bring the money. I have run two pension funds. I know how much money is out there that is available to fund this kind of activity. People have money. They are investing in government bonds. They are looking for these kinds of developments to put money in. Government just needs to create the problem on the right scale and give people the things that they can put money into. And I think with that, if you solve the demand supply problem, I think these questions around rent and whether you're paying annually or whether you're paying monthly, which people only get away with because they have houses and people need houses and there are no houses. Um, so to the extent that people are breaking the law, we will prosecute them. And if you prosecute people who break the law, then others will not break the law. Right? But if you don't prosecute people who break the law, then people will do it with impunity. So we'll do it. But I, I say that the problem is not that. The problem is the longer term problem of demand and supply. You need a government that is thinking on a large scale systematically about the problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Dirty. And to Mr. Rhodes, before you do respond, in large cities around the world, whether it be Sao Paulo, Beijing, Shanghai, um, Korea, Japan, they've run out of space just like Lagos State. Therefore, you can only build vertically moving forward. However, we do have a problem, a perennial problem of buildings collapsing. How do we deal with this problem? Okay. Um, I actually worked with the Chinese government in relation to urbanization. I'm an architect, as you might know. So the only way that we can solve this problem is one, building upwards, and two, opening Lagos up. Initially, when we started, I talked about a circular belt road that links the um, Victoria Island site, Ibejuleki, and Ikurudu Trekpe. By opening all that land up from Badori upwards, we now have a lot more space to be able to actually build land, um, build buildings and affordable housing. Now, in achieving this, you can actually start to get higher volumes and higher densities in that area. But aside from that, I think that it's extremely important that in whatever we're doing in relation to affordability, in relation to 
mega structures across Lagos State. Inclusivity is something that is extremely important. The idea and vision of development of Lagos leaves the poor behind. Right? They want to create an idea of a Dubai or an Eco-Atlantic, but there is no inclusive housing there. There is no affordable housing plan, really. In my government, for you to get planning permission, there must be a plan for inclusive and affordable multi-income housing in that project. Now, if the developer insists that it does not pay him to have that unit there, then the government will allocate land for them to build that exact unit. Developers can aggregate and build those units across Lagos State. So that is one thing that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at creating huge amounts of affordable housing. Like he said, we need to be doing about 40,000 units a year, and we must be doing modular affordable housing with alternative means of construction, not the standard brick and mortar that's costing an arm and leg. We need to do a lot of projects, and we need to do it fast. So that's what we're going to do. Gentlemen, thank you very much again for your responses. We're going to take a very quick commercial break. And when we come back, the third and final segment of the 2023 Lagos gubernatorial debates right here in Lagos. Stay with us. Welcome back to the 2023 Lagos State gubernatorial debates brought to you by the platform Nigeria. And this is our third and final segment featuring the candidates of ADC, the Labour Party, and PDP. Earlier, Governor Songwalu of APC opted not to participate in the debates. Um, gentlemen, before we continue, um, we do have a fact-checking uh, team. So again, we have a responsibility to go back and check particularly when numbers or statistics are put out. And I just wanted to point out nothing personal that in 2017, Lagos State actually did implement a wetland policy. So I just wanted to point that out to Mr. Rhodes before here. And we will continue to do that throughout the course of this debate in the interest of fairness. Again, gentlemen, excellent contribution so far. Let's continue with our debate today. Um, the next segment that I'd like to deal with, or the next question that I'd like to deal with right now, deals with our youth. 60% um, of the population of Lagos State is aged between 16 and 35. Approximately 13 million young people, dynamic, innovative, resourceful, creative, and trendsetters, cross-sectorally, in sports, entertainment, tourism, culture and fashionomics. Today, our culture, the Nigerian culture, much of it coming out of Lagos State, has taken the world by storm. In many ways, the youth have been able to do this on their own. But there's much more that we can do and we must do as governments and as leaders to unleash the great potential that our youth do have. So gentlemen, I just want to ask you this question right now and I want you to Concentrate in the following areas. Mr. Rhodes Vivo, entertainment and fashion, what will you do? Mr. Jando Adediron, tourism and culture. And Mr. Funsha Duarte, sports. What can we do to turn the potential, the dynamic potential of our youth, into wealth creating opportunities? What would you do as governor of Lagos State? I'm going to start with Mr. Rhodes Vivo first. Okay. Um, in relation to entertainment and fashion, the idea is to ensure that the state is actually becomes a 24-hour state, a state in which there's so much possibility, there's less insecurity, a state that people can feel they can stay at events and cultural events and hang out till late at night without feeling that they might be robbed on their way home. It's creating this environment that allows art to prosper. And that's what we're going to be doing in Lagos. We're going to, like I said earlier, we're going to tackle the agro situation, ensure we have surveillance around the entire state, and celebrate our youth and culture with zoning areas specifically for these things. We're going to look at Lagos State and ensure that we create sustainable local governments that celebrate particular industries. And that's what we're going to be doing in Lagos. Currently, there's an attempt at that with the Onicon Axis. You have the J.K. Randall Center that's being built, parking there and museums. We want to extend all of that and restore the history of Lagos Island as well. And with youth, we're going to be partnering and doing celebrations and events with them that also showcase them to the world. 
and showcase Lagos State as a place where you can come and do business in creative arts. ArtX is already doing something like that. We'll partner with them and celebrate them even more and engage other agencies that are celebrating arts and culture because we want to make Lagos State the center of arts and culture in Africa. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose Vivo. Welcome to Mr. Jando Adediron for your response in regards to tourism and culture. The state is, is blessed um, already with potentials in tourism. Uh, we've spoken about our coastline here. Uh, you know, in tourism, there's something we call MICE. You know, when you have a center for meetings, international conferences, exhibitions, and all that. So we ensure that we have partnership that will come and give us a Miami-like waterfront in our coastline, and we have what you have in this. When we have that, it gives opportunity to our young ones. Today, we have, um, we, we, we have something in our hand that this current government is about to take away. And I'll give you an example. Every time you have events in Lagos, either any of the awards and all that, all of our younger people have something to do. The one that will sew, the one that will do makeup and all of that. But unfortunately, this government took a particular one to Atlanta last year and thereby took away the little thing our, our youth would do to earn living. So he doesn't understand the economy. You won't blame him. And uh, by, by, by so doing, what we should have to give this. So we're going to make sure that we preserve the little that we have. We then encourage you know, PPP to come and do more so that our youth can tap into this because we already have the talent here to do all of those things. So that is what we're doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Vidira. And Mr. Doherty. Thank you very much um, <clears throat> for that question. And as you know, um, can we just have quiet in the audience, please? Uh, Mr. Doherty, over to you that, that, um, for your input with that, regards to sports in which we have great potential. Thank you. We do have great potential in sports. Uh, and as you know, our median age in Nigeria is about 17. And there's no reason to suggest Lagos is any different. And sports is about youth, right? So um, one of the central elements of our educational uh, agenda is to increase the role of sports even within our schools. And this is across local governments and wards. And so um, having early programs to bring children into sports, having um, a program of, of mentoring, uh, following them as they emerge, uh, d identifying those who are gifted in particular areas, and ensuring that the state supports them, provides facilities, uh, and, and essentially uh, provides all that is required for, for each of these to have the opportunity to engage in tournaments, whether it's at the local government level, tournaments at the state level, internationally, to develop them. If you, if you think about a, a nation like Jamaica, for example, and you think about the program that they have in, in um, sprinting in Jamaica, you see how many world champions they produce. And it's not by accident. It's because they have a program that is, it is designed from the ground up where they bring those kids up through the system. And we can do this in Lagos. And we'll do it um, not just for kids who are in formal school, but it also creates the opportunity to bring back those that have fallen out of the school system and give them something to come back to and, and have a, a, a means of using the gifts that they have and then expressing themselves and becoming a resource for the state. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to ask you a very quick question here again. Um, it wasn't one that I had intended to ask earlier, but we've heard great ideas, innovative solutions, and this tends to be the case in pretty much every debate. However, implementation tends to be a challenge. Promises are made, but most times promises are not kept. What will you do as a governor to ensure that the promises you make on this platform will be implemented if given the opportunity? I want to give you 60 seconds each just to respond to that question. I'm going to start with Mr. Rose Vivo. I'm going to go to Mr. Adediro and end with you, Mr. Doherty. 60 seconds each. Why should you be trusted to be able to implement the ideas that you've articulated this evening? Why should I be trusted, or how are we going to implement Both. It? Okay. Um, well, I think, it's a, I think it's a combo of questions. Okay. We're talking about the lack of implementation when promises are made. Okay. So again, you're appealing to a large electorate yes. to nominate you as governor of Lagos State. Yes. Okay, so professionally, I've worked with Chinese government and urban development as well as the American government. 
um, when I returned to Nigeria, I got into affordable housing using um, alternative means of housing to be able to deliver housing at 40 to 50 percent less than the standard building. When I decided I wanted to go into politics, I went back to school to get a master's in research in public policy, making me a public policy expert. Um, in my life as a, um, as a citizen, I've engaged the government on agriculture policy, on history in, um, in the curriculum, in ed on education policy. And then as a politician, I've run at the local government level, at the senatorial level, and there's a consistency in opposing the lack of merit and lack of quality governance that we have in Lagos State over a period of time and a desire to build the best capacity to serve Lagos in the most excellent way that I can. And I've demonstrated this all across from my thesis at MIT where we tackled um, waste management to use a communal-based waste management system to actually solve the waste problems, which I got a distinction for. There is a consistency in my trajectory all the way up to here. In, 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 other words, in other words, what you are saying, Mr. Rhodes, your voice, is that you're a man of your word. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said, in other words, what you're saying is that you're a man of your word. Yes, I am. All right. So we'll go to Mr. Didiron here. 60 okay. seconds. Why, okay, uh, why is it that we make all of these great promises and many times we fall right, I, I think there is, you um, to make a difference? I think there is only one problem in the state of Lagos that is confronting implementation of any policies or whatever promises anybody has made. And that problem is the monopoly that we have. Because every other person that has occupied that office up until now always require a second level approval before they can get things work. So that monopoly is what we are breaking. We will break it. And if we break it, we'll then have an independent governor who will, whose, whose word will be his bond, just like I'm saying now, because I wasn't rerouted into this, unlike my friend that ran away. We, uh, we had conviction to do this, and we are here to break free Lagos. And we believe we will do that. If we do that, then Lagos implementation will be a problem. My word, we will implement every policy that we have promised it. That's why I keep saying, no, we can't do something in four years. This is what we can do, and we will do them. And we will do it together with Lagosians. Thank you very much, Mr. Jando. Mr. Doherty, over to you. Thank you very 60 much. 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a great question, and I think that what people should do is to go back and look at people's track records. I think people do not show up on this stage without a track record. I have 30 years in the private sector. I have run three companies as CEO, two of which are national companies, with national as to scope, uh, offices, staff, customers, assets in the hundreds of billions. People have entrusted me as a fiduciary for most of my career. You can go back and verify. Ask people about me, what have I done? Look, what is most lacking in government is character. It's not people standing up on this stage and saying, I think this should be done, or I think that should be done, or, I think that should be done. It's who's going to get into that governor's office. Sit down on that seat. Be a principal, not an agent. Be a principal, not an agent. Somebody who has stood up to authority, who has stood up even to superior authority and said, no, I know you are the boss, but I think that is wrong. You need somebody who has the character of leadership. I have had character of leadership think, from an early childhood. I, I think on I that was note. head boy in my primary and school. And on that note. I have been leading. People have, people Mr. have elected me. Mr. Doherty, we do have to. Our leader. We do have to. Thank you very much um, for your respective contributions. One of the things that was really evident in the last debate four years ago and even here is that Lagos State is not short of ideas and not short of men and women with great intellect. The fact of the matter is that regardless of who wins, the capacity and the resources are there to collectively make a difference and make Lagos State the envy of the world in the future. I wish you gentlemen all the very best. We're coming to a close in just a few minutes, but I want us to deal with the issue of digital access and digital economies. The fact of the matter is that the cities of the world 
or the cities of the future will be smart cities. So I just want to ask you here, what are your plans with regards to the digital ecosystem to use that again to exponentially create opportunities and create wealth for the people of Lagos State? I'm going to start with Mr. Jando Adediro first, go to Mr. Funsha Duati, and end with Mr. Rhodes Vivo. Over to you, sir. I think it's about time to take advantage of the new monetary policy of the Central Bank um, of Nigeria uh, by ensuring that um, we have our young people uh, engaged in what you call fintech training and give a startup. If we do that, then we'll make a whole lot of people self-sufficient. And before you know it, there'll be an employer of labor in your economy uh, because there is a market already because that woman who is selling XYZ now needs something to scan and make and see that his money has come in this cashless policy. So we are going to take advantage of that first, because this is what is upon us as we speak, and have more of our people. That's why we are building technovation hubs in five divisions of Lagos, not 20, like somebody promised, five, five divisions of Lagos. And we will do this so that we can, we can have our young people there, train them and give them startups thereafter so that they can go into this, because that is what is upon us as we speak. So we have a clear plan on that one, and we're looking at the younger generation of Lagos uh, residents. Thank you very much. And to you, Mr. Duarte. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as part of our Tiger agenda, we have something which we call focus industries, and one of the focus industries is this tech industry. We think that this is one of the industries where Lagos can have a comparative advantage, where we can be a global champion, we can be a leader, not just in Africa, but in the world. And we think that we need to focus on those entities. We also have a disproportionately young population. And the tech industry, as you know globally, is, it, is an industry of the youth. So what we will do is we will support um, tech entrepreneurs. We will create um, uh, hubs where we provide infrastructure for them to, to expand and, and sort of uh, um, build their creative ideas. Um, we will give them the infrastructure. One of the things which we define is in defining infrastructure for a city, and our eye in our Tiger agenda is infrastructure to support a modern mega city. We define infrastructure across several dimensions. One of those dimensions is tech and telecom infrastructure. So it's important that there's ubiquitous bad broadband, for example, in a city like Lagos, so that people in Yabakon, which is our own Silicon Valley, as you know, they need to be supported, and we need to give them everything that they need to do us proud, the same way that the entertainers have done the tech guys can do the same for us. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Duarte. Mr. Rod River. Our governments are supposed to trying to tax tech hubs because they hear that they are making all this money. We'll instead enable them. We'll would invest in brilliant ideas that they have. We we'll remove all the bottlenecks of right of way that current um, data infrastructure people are dealing with. We we'll ensure that we enable that as much as possible and connect that to primary and secondary schools so that from an early age they are already digital savvy. We we'll also ensure that we have fab labs and skill acquisition centers in every local government. To Space landmass, I mean, there's only so much dredging we can do. So my question to you is, what do you intend to do in terms of partnering with other nearby states giving your limited landmass, and what states and what sectors would you partner with them on? And to Mr. Olajide Jando Adediron, the excessive bureaucracy that seems to permeate government in Nigeria in general, whether it's taxes, permits, or levies, how do you intend to handle that? Considering that Nigerians already pay a huge implicit tax by providing water for themselves, electricity for themselves, and so many other amenities that should be the purview of government. And to Mr. Funsha Doherty, apart from the size of Lagos State, what is the most distinctive advantage that Lagos State has, and how do you intend to leverage that in terms of attracting investments into this metropolis? In that order, Mr. Vivo, I'll start with you. Okay. So Lagos, Lagos State has a comparative advantage of hosting a port which allows for packaging to be able to be an industry that will do very well here. So we want Lagos State to be known as the place where you go to get your goods packaged and processed. In terms of partnering with states that share boundaries with Lagos State, we'll be looking to create manufacturing and processing that's already currently being done, but we expand on it. So we also create jobs and also um, 
the, to um, reduce the amount of people in Lagos and push them, push uh, more housing into bordering states. We'll have a relationship with them that allows for more production and packaging that we can then export based on our comparative advantage being close to the ports. We'll also ensure that housing is also connected to the train system and the road and transportation networks that we are building so that we can also have more people coming from the outside of Lagos into, into Lagos in less than one hour. The idea is Lagos State, from Lagos State all the way to Abidjan is a megapolis in the next 30, 40 years. We are going to grow in a huge amount, in a significant amount, up to 40, 50 million. So we must ensure that we can move upwards as opposed to into the water. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodzivo. Greatly appreciate it. And over to you, okay, if Mr. My, <clears throat> if my question is speaking to multiple taxation, if, if I understand that clearly, then well, I it, it is what would you do to reduce excessive bureaucracy, the burden of it, through multiple so, so, permits and levies? So I, I'll tell you where, where that problem is coming from so that we can provide solutions to it. And, and if you don't know where you're coming from, we don't know where we're going. In January 2022, Lagos Internal Revenue Service reported 4.5 million Lagosians in the tax net of Lagos. In November that same year, it came to 3 you know, um, million people in that, that which shows that the economy is bad. So the little one, what we then do is to see how we uh, tax them multiply. But what we need to do is we need to grow the economy first and make sure we have more people back into business. If we have that, there won't be need for you to ask one person to pay for 20 person. So if you grow the economy, you have more people paying. And harmonization is what they've used in, in, in uh, taxing people. Uh, multiply. What we need to do is to really check and put information out there. If we have harmonized, this is the amount of money you have paid for this service for that service. Do not pay XYZ to anybody again. We have to be transparent about this, we have to be deliberate about it, and we have to be truthful so that we can, all the businesses that have left Lagos to elsewhere can return when they see a, a, a business friendly environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jadda. Mr. Funchadati, over to you. What did I see as our greatest resource, if, if I remember your question? Uh, I'll answer that and I'll set it in a context. So rather counterintuitively, I think that our greatest resource actually is our people. So me, people point to our population and say it's a very large population and think of it as a, you know, a burden around their neck. But the truth of the matter is, if not for the fact that government is not supportive of those people and is more a weight on those people, those guys should be the engine of the economy. What do I mean? If you look at our government reform agenda, one of the things that we're saying is that we want a government that acts in such a way that creates a broad-based, prosperous society. If you have a government where actions being taken by public officers are self-serving and they are self-interested, over time, what will happen is the resources of that state will end up in a few hands. And most of the people will not have prosperity, right? In such a situation, people cannot aspire, wealth cannot go round, and people cannot do well. And people will then become a liability rather than an asset. So I think if you address government reform, the true value of our most of our greatest resource, which is our people, will be unleashed. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, um, in Yoruba, we have a saying that Tebiba Wonu Oroimiki Iwobe, right? I guess I'm correct. In that regard, feeding 23 million Lagosians is not an easy task. What do you intend to do to add value to the food that we produce in abundance in order to feed the people of Lagos State? I want to give you 90 seconds each to think through this issue. And the reason for that is other than housing, the cost of food is the second largest expenditure for most people who live in this state. Food is a critical issue. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Doherty, go on to Mr. Rose Vivot, and end with Mr. Ledima, in that order. So I think the question of food security is very important for Lagos. 
uh, I think it's something that Lagos has to address, not just as Lagos, but I think as part of a regional strategy. So some of the things we said earlier about how do we work with our, our, our neighbors to create a food security strategy uh, for Lagos. I think this is, this is one area where we can have that regional cooperation. I think also that Lagos is suited for agro-allied uh, enterprise, right? Because again, we have a large population. We're here by the coast. Um, as long as we can sort out the logistics of getting um, um, you know, the raw materials here, this is a great place actually for adding value to those, to those raw materials. We have our export processing here in the Lekki uh, corridor, and we can do a whole lot more around that. Now, if we now tie that into regional strategy, for example, with our neighbor Ogun State, where we can evacuate some of that stuff and, and use that also as a channel for bringing in this, the, the, the goods, perhaps by a rail link uh, direct from there in, th through to, uh, to Ogun. That solves a lot of the, a lot of the problem. So I think that this is just an area where government needs to think more creatively. And by the way, the fact that we're Lagos does not mean we have no place where people can farm. We have some, and we should support them. We should not ignore the, the agro-industry within Lagos, because we have people who are working hard, farming every day. I was talking with a gentleman the other day who has a farming network, and he's doing good work, and he's been running a successful business for many years. So even within our state, we must have our own food security uh, a policy that supports farmers within our state whilst looking at a regional strategy um, and, and a port strategy as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Duarte. Mr. Rotary, over to you. So I'm going to agree with him and talk about the regional strategy. We have mangoes, oranges, rotting in Benue, and we're importing concentrates in Lagos. We need to have a regional agreement that allows for processing and investing these things. Cold storage is another important factor. In most markets, you have 70, 60 to 70 percent of tomatoes that are rot in the market, as well, as well as a lot of organic goods. We're going to have cold storage in all our markets and operate it like a bank system. You bring, you take your goods when you sell and you're done. You come back and get some more, so that all that in that whole process, the food is being stored properly and is not wasted away. In that, you're increasing the potential income by a significant amount. Secondly, 40 percent of the cost of goods, food goods, is tied into logistics and transportation. And this is also tied into bad roads and whole process of bringing things in to Lagos State. It costs much more to get something from the ports to Ikorodu than it costs to bring it from China to Lagos. This is something that we need to look at in relation to the agri roads and um, the system in Lagos State that creates all these multiple taxes on logistics and transportation. In doing this and having effective good roads, we reduce the cost of transportation, and that will also tie into reduction in cost of commodities. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodrigo. Mr. David, over to you. Okay, so uh, for me, I'm just going to go. I won't go far. I will stay with my neighbors in you know, State, in your State, and we do some sort of partnership. I've told them, you know what? I have water. In what you call aquaculture, I can build hubs for seafood. Uh, industry, then you have lands, we can go into partnership, and you give me every other thing that grows from land, then we do that, I create hub, uh, we build infrastructure to connect both, so we have what we call uh, some sort of partnership as far as food security is concerned. I do know that currently we have a farm settlement in Etoike, uh, I actually don't know the state of that farm settlement now, because it appears our friend that ran away, um, really do not... Uh, anything to show for his four years. So we will revisit that place and see the state of Itoike farm settlement and see how we can resuscitate it. But more importantly, we are focusing on what we have, which is our water, and building what we call aquaculture, going into aquaculture, build hubs for food, um, seafood industry and create employment from there. We have more food to eat. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And I, I, I would like to go on to my very last question here as we bring this debate to a close. And I want to provide you with an opportunity to provide closing remarks, but again reminding the viewers and the electorates of why they should vote for you as the next governor of Lagos State. But as you do that, I'd like you to mention in two minutes each what your number one priority would be immediately you come into office. Gentlemen, I'm going to start in the following order. PDP, Labour Party, and ADC. Gentlemen, over to you. The race is on. 
Okay, so I know that everybody speaks about 100 days in office. Uh, but in my own case, I will use his own last 100 days in office to start my own administration and to combat a problem that we always have during transition, which is in May. What is this problem? Flooding in the state of Lagos. So what I'm going to do with his own last 100 days is to engage volunteers and those who would want government patronage in environmental sanitation work. So you know what? For four years, this man has left our water collectors, you know, filled with silt and all of that. Can we start the silting? Because rain is coming upon us in the month of May. I want to come into office and have, I mean, there is a problem to deal with. So we start clearing this so that in that time, we will have a senior Lagos, at least, because we need to build more collectors. We only have six in the state of Lagos. If you take the Odo Yalaru that take water from Agege Omutoro down to Aboye Creek, the second one is um, the one in um, Shomulu Pariga that takes it to Unilag, the one in Unilag that serves the entire Yaba, and Aguda in Suriri. They're just building the seventh one now in the Lubiri, 1.2 kilometer. In the state of Lagos, we should be speaking about 15 water collectors, but even the six are not cleared. So we're going to do this first. When I get into office, then we face this issue of traffic. I have mentioned flashpoint to you. What we need to do is to take a very difficult decision and say, you know what, there's a new sheriff in town, in town, the one that doesn't require second level approval. You need to, this issue of making sure you park on the road, maybe at the is taking to, I will put a stop to that nonsense in the state of Lagos. I will create laybys immediately for all the, if you don't have business on you, just pull off and drop your passengers. That way, we will, we will start well. Those are the things that Lagosians need to be. Traffic, flood, we'll take care of it. And out of school children, just like I said, two million, we'll take care of them. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdulaziz Olajide Jando Adijima. And we will go next to Mr. Gbadibor Rhodes Vivo for his final comments. In the first 100 days, we'll open up Lagos accounts, publish it, and ensure that everybody has access to line-by-line -line items of our expenditures, our procurements, and everything financially related to the state. And it will be easy to access, unlike what is currently in the government where the, uh, the website has been down for so long. We are going to ensure that we depoliticize the entire waste management system. We are extremely underserved. There are so many people that have not seen PSP trucks in years. We are going to open it to the private sector. So once you have a truck that meets the requirements, you can enroll very seamlessly and engage and start servicing the people. We are going to also deliver rail systems and ensure that it's carrying cargo and humans. We are going to dredge our waterways properly and we are going to map out our seabed so that the private sector can actually get involved in water transportation. Currently, there is no data. Our local government structure is going to be robust. We're going to ensure we have potential governors as local government chairmen, not what is currently um, available, where it's just a place where they reward local party men. We're going to also ensure that we open up the Badagri division, the Kurudu division, and ensure that development goes into that area for leisure, for um, ecotourism, and also for and also for, to a large and lengthy the, um, aquaculture value chain. Lastly, we're going to depoliticize the entire system of waste management. I've said that already. And if once we do this, the private sector can get in. And then transportation, the BRT needs to be open to the private sector. Currently, it is politicized. And people have to wait for 30, between, te between 10 to 30 minutes for a bus to come. We need more buses. And we're going to open this to the private sector. If you have a bus that meets the requirements, you can use the BRT lane. The idea is that we're not going to have a government whose, whose purse strings determine the level of development. We create an enabling environment for the private sector to actually get involved in infrastructure development. Mr. Gladiba Rhodes, people, thank you very much for your final comments. And we come to the last, but certainly not the least, Mr. Funcho Doherty. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an agenda which lists our priorities. We call it the Tiger Agenda. T is tax reform for equity, prosperity, and growth. I is infrastructure to support a modern mega city. G is government reform. E is education and health systems that the people trust. And R is rule of law and public order. With respect to our first 100 days, some of the things that you can expect to see, 
and I'm standing on this stage saying them now, and put me in mind of them. We'll declare a state of emergency on the roads, flashpoints that my friend has talked about, tow trucks, rapid, inter rapid intervention mechanisms. We will ban, as part of our Ibero solution problem, we will ban the collection of tax levies on the highways. We will ban it. We will review the tax, tax and levies that are collected in general. We will launch a review of the fourth mainland bridge. We will stop it and launch a review before we carry on with that thing to determine if it makes sense to spend $2.5 million, which is about 2 trillion naira, to deliver that project. We will publish information on the blue line. Why has it taken 14 years? How much have they spent? We will put it in the public domain so that you can see. We will, un we will unwind Alpha Beta. I have said this. We will unwind Alpha Beta. We will begin a, a, a public sector compensation survey. We will, we, will raise, we will raise that compensation as part of a program to get it to a reasonable compensation, not just saying we increase by 10% or 15%. We will upgrade the leadership of the Attorney General's office, audit, surveillance. We will get them to sign conflict of interest attestations that we do in the private sector, and we will hold them to it. And immediately we will start to prosecute people. We will start to prosecute people. And you will see that the actions of your government will begin to represent your interests, and you will see it reflected across all policy areas. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our distinguished participants and contestants for the Office of Governor of the greatest state in Nigeria, the state of Lagos. I'd like to say a very big thank you to our Labour Party candidates, Mr. Gadibar Rhodes Vavo, to my extreme right, Mr. Fonsho Doherty of the ABC. And representing the PDP, Mr. Abdulaziz Alagide Jandor Adirio. Gentlemen, I want to gentlemen, I want to sincerely thank you. I want to thank you for the civility of your engagement. Unusual many times in politics, this has been a very civil conversation. I commend you for it. And as you go forth, we pray and we trust that we will have an election that is peaceful and beneficial to the people of Lagos State. Thank you for your innovative ideas. Thank you for your, not only innovative ideas, for the willingness to collaborate even with your neighbor states. And I do trust that regardless of who becomes the governor of Lagos State, the three or the four of you will find ways of working together to make this place the greatest smart city on the continent of Africa. I want to say a very big thank you to our wonderful audience here at the Marriott Hotel in Ikeja. You've been fantastic. And on behalf of the platform of Nigeria, it's convener, Bojo Oyemade, and the fantastic team that has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this possible. You won't believe how much work has gone into it, but that's another story in itself. Please give the organizers and the backing team a resounding round of applause. To the people of Lagos State, I wish you well and great success. My name is Victor Ladakun. It's been a wonderful pleasure being your moderator. God bless you and God bless Nigeria. television event.